Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Perfides, where we are going to be checking and touching on many of the topics that are affecting or guiding our modern performance engineers in their endeavors. And if you remember from last episode, uh, my amigo Henrik and I were discussing a little bit about the job market, right, Henrik? Yeah, correct. And we mentioned a few tools during that episode. Yeah, there were some things where in the previous episode, uh, we stopped a little bit on what tools were needed and what were the requirements? What were the new tasks or functions that these tools had to um, serve to us when we were doing performance in these modern times? Because it's not anymore just scripting and slamming the system and checking if it survives, measuring through our automations. I don't know if... Um, I mean, um, being totally transparent and open here, both Henrik and I work for companies that uh, create tools that are around the performance, not only for performance, but are around the trade. So I wanted today to bring these tools as categories, as things that we could do uh, where we can, of course, we might have to mention our uh, employers uh, <laughs> tool-wise, but we're trying to be as unbiased as possible, as holistic and transparent on what are the types of tools that you can use or should be, you, you will be required to be able to use in this modern performance job market. And well, beware, we are not biased. We're trying to make our best to show you the whole Enchilada, <laughs> in terms of performance testing tools or related. And we will cover a couple of tools, suggestions of tools, of course. But again, you may probably going to use a tool that you're not aware. So uh, we, we will be very, very eager to know which tools you're using. So if you have any ideas or if you have any recommendation for our performance community, drop a comment below and add your tool of a choice because there are so many tools out there. We cannot list every tools that are, are available. And as well, I don't I don't think that we should be kind of just listing them. I want to have like how to call it categories of tools because yes, I think we should follow the actual the old fashioned process of performance engineering and 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 provide the the value of the tools and and show a couple of examples of tools that we may have to use in those given situations. So what do we start from the beginning, Leandro? What would be the beginning for you because? Um, oh, but the beginning for me is like if we wanna if I want to do some performance engineering or modify or optimize things, I need to understand the actual situation. So there are tools out there that gives you insights about the actual traffic, the actual usage. And from there we can start analyzing and, and figure out, okay, if I want to have a realistic performance engineering approach, this is how I will do it. Um, so this will be for me the understanding the what is actually how the user are interacting with my system. This is a very good point because this approach that you are presenting, like this first step, I do agree. It's um, super important, but not for new projects when you are just creating the MVP or like these big bang releases that we had in the past. No, now you are referring to agile projects that are already there in production. Are going to oh, something even. growing? If I have a gig, uh, I need to deliver a quick, uh, quick load testing for a, a retailer, for example, to cover the Black Friday. Uh, I need numbers because um, if I want to make a realistic uh, test or a realistic ramp up or stress test, depending on what you have, the objective of your 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 project, uh, you need at least have numbers. That and you need to find those numbers. And the golden rule that we talked about several years: if someone gives you a number, don't trust the number try to, to figure out if that number is actually real and realistic and and, rely, and align with uh, the actual usage. So how did we used to do that before these tools that we are going to be talking about? Because this has been something that we had to do for ages. And because uh, you're, you're talking about designing the mix and scenario, well, right? I mean, I'm, I mean, over the, I mean, now I think for, for the new uh, people that starts their career in performance engineering, it's good news because it's much more simpler than we, we used to be in the past. But you may have, you may be working may, soon or 
in the future in a restricted environment where you don't have those tools. So you have to figure out, take your Swiss army knife and say, okay, well, okay, I'm going to take this, this, this knife because it's going to be aligned with the project. And to start, I would say, uh, usually if you, especially if you do like a, a retailer or, or a public website testing, um, what I used to do is I requested to have access or have someone sharing the access or someone making an export of Google Analytics traffic. Uh, because that, or if you, I'm taking Google Analytics as an example, but there is also Adobe uh, providing similar tools. There are other tools that are out there in the market. But the idea is to use a marketing, because it's, it's at the end, it's very marketing-ish tooling. But it gives you at least uh, the number of use sessions that comes in and which areas they're hitting, which page. And I think it's a, it gives you a good direction to start analyzing. Um, but oh, I mean, you mentioned uh, today, most of our customers are, I hope that from, from, a, from a dietary perspective, <laughs> that everyone has observed in place. They have real user monitoring utilized. And then you don't need those this uh, Google Analytics anymore because you will do the analytics based on the user sessions discovered by the real user monitoring. So that will be a good starting point as well. You're right, because um, in the past, you just reminded me some experiences that you had to play good cop and bad cop with the business and say, you're going to tell me how many invoices per month are you processing or how many, very similar to what you're suggesting, check Google Analytics, check the Adobe Metrics or many of the other uh, platforms that will provide this information that you're looking for, right? Or, or even what I, I was doing quite a bit, quite a quite, quite in a significant way, either for end-to-end -end testing, or for just component level testing. If you just hit an, uh, uh, microservices, is utilize the access logs. I mean, even if you, you work in a Kubernetes environment, or if you you're you working in a traditional bare environment, there's a big chance that you're hitting a proxy, or there's a big chance that there's a front layer that will route your traffic to your component. And by just looking at the access logs, even if it's a one one line is uh, one URL, the good thing is if you can extend that logs because you can add more and more information in those loggings level, then you can have the IP address, the session, and then, yeah, with magic and with a couple of Pythons, Python, Python code or Java, whatever you prefer, you can start to map and, and link those requests together and say, oh, so the, 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 the user started with this URL and then went to this URL and this URL. And then you are rebuilding at the end in a bit manual fashion way, but you're rebuilding the user interactions. And that is also a good way of saying, oh, I know that most of the user is going to uh, searching a product and looking at the product and adding it to the cart. So um, it's quite obvious if you are <laughs> in a website, but you need the numbers behind the scenes. So that, that will give you a, a lot of big good numbers to start building your performance testing approach. But you hit another interesting thing that uh, with the logs, which are, I, I count them as a tool for performance analysis of uh, utilization patterns, but you also needed uh, godlike permissions to get access to those logs and some of those things, which always was, kind of political and at times well you it's the equivalent of bringing the blood of 10 virgins and the scales of a dragon and silly things to get those access and permissions gladly nowadays we have many of the platforms that uh henry uh, mentioned observability platforms because what you were saying gathering the logs and putting together like hey where did the user went through i have some idea here you were just generating kind of traces uh, by hand and you, you were manually tracing and connecting the breadcrumbs of your user and trying to figure it out fortunately modern tools uh observability tools that we have nowadays will provide this information uh right away we have tools like uh datadog new relic uh dynatrace grafana app dynamics and the list is big i think those may be the biggest players that i am aware of did i forget any other no, right. Lightstep, of course, right. Honeycomb, yeah, right. um, and and many, 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 and Logs.io. Uh, there's a lot of uh, solutions out there doing a fantastic job. The other thing is, is you make sure that the tool that are in place collecting logs have good user monitoring, because at the end, and, and most, most, most of her, most of everything is having a query language, because at the end. Uh, you may have some data that you look on the screen and visualize that, but if you have the options to query and extract and process, that will help you to do the aggregation somehow 
of the average usage. What I used to like to do when I was doing some uh, performance gigs, I was trying to rebuild a Senke graph. You know what? When you know what is a Senke graph? Uh, so when you have please explain it for the ones that don't. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the you have a, like a, a funnel. So you see 100% tra traffic goes to the homepage, and then you have 30% going to slash card, and then and then you see the actual traffic how it's split it. And if you have a Senke graph, when you do as a performance engineer, you know exactly how you're going to distribute the traffic within uh, the interaction on the website. It's so, uh, so rich. Um, it, it takes time to produce it, but once you have done it once, then you're you're confident. You know where you, which direction you're going to take and how you're going to do it. So it's fantastic. No, and uh, an advantage of this that shows you, like, ma made me think of the Marvel multiverse that you certainly see where the branches are, the users are going to different realities or pages, where um, any of the thick, thick branches is where you should be paying more attention to create your uh, multi-end-to-end step automations to generate the simulations, but you got it right. One key element here is a good querying capability on the information available from the system so that you can look for what is important. And this is very useful uh, for uh, user flows, the, the, these step-by-step -step paths. But if your system is just um, uh, service-oriented, microservices and all these type of things, I think we should do a different approach, not uh, these users end to end and multi steps. The pyramid of automation commands us to do something different, right? Yeah, but if you even if you have a single component, or so just with the access log and, and a good query language, you can rebuild that syncing graph. I mean, it mm -hmm. will take a bit more time, um, but at the end, uh, consider that the data that you have in your IT environment is the gold. And uh, if you want to be rich, utilize the gold, <laughs> the gold that you have already in place, and then uh, you will do magic, magical things. This is a, like the first step. As you were mentioning, these new tools, modern, because yeah, I think 10 years ago, it was super difficult to extract this information easily, transparently, or in a centralized manner without convincing admins and going through all those loops of fire that we had to. Nowadays, if you learn how to query these tools, query this information, these logs and the and all this, you can very quickly have an analysis of, on one hand, as Hendrik says, the user paths with these graphs, or how much should you hit each service in each element on your page of how much to generate this mix. If you want to make it modular per service or per user flow, you can have those statistics and I've seen some very good query builders that right away with a good query can just like have a scenario designed uh, pretty quickly, which, yeah, this is your main safe point. This is your main um, flow of users. This is second, third, fourth place. Uh, how uh, much do you want to go further? And there you have it almost even uh, I, I saw long ago one, one person that just put together this query that would even give you what is the... Um, pacing that you should give to your script to keep iterating. Now, like, that's pretty clever. That's um, having knowing how to query this uh, information. I think it's the very first step and knowing in these tools how to do it. In my opinion, again, this is, uh, if you understand the concept behind, it's going to be very easy if you find a customer that has one of the tools to another customer that has another. One may be LogQL, the other PromQL, the other I don't know. DQL. Uh, DQL. Which one is the Splunk one? I can't remember. Yeah, DQL is Dynatrace query language, but uh, the Splunk, I don't know. They don't remember the name of their. Query. Yeah, they had like also a specific uh, query. They are more or less the same, all of them. But when you understand what you're trying to do, uh, it's just like, yeah, this new tool, I just need to get the logs, paint it pretty, and see what is happening and get the information. There, there's one tool that you're probably going to need, uh, even if you don't have the data. There's a tool that I've been using so much when I was doing performance. It's the the best local database uh, uh -oh. software that we mm -hmm. have. <laughs> what are you going to mention? Hmm. We may uh, fight on this one. Go on. <laughs> it's an Excel sheet. Um, so at the end, uh, with a if oh just... Excel. Okay, okay. Excel. Yeah, That's, yeah, 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 yeah. I was. <laughs> I thought that you were gonna go. So the other tool that I was thinking is Tableau, which helps uh, tab you. Yeah. Tableau is is. Is great. 
Um, yeah, a lot of people are utilizing it to do the analysis, I would say. Um, but it, I mean, I think it's it's uh, very powerful. But if you never touch Kablo in, in your life, <gasps> that's going to be um, an interesting experience. The, yeah. Especially because, in my opinion, Kablo is a tool that is good for so many other things that you may be lost a little bit in the uh, uh, I think, reach. I think Tableau, Tableau was, was awesome uh, at the moment where we did not have uh, the all those observative vendor solution supporting all those signals and supporting uh, lower aggregation, so uh, more data, less gran more granularity on, on the data points, and then do the analytics on top of that. At the end, we didn't have that, so what the performance engineer was mainly doing was exporting the raw data from the, from the low test or from other stuff, uh, feeding it back to a Tableau and then creating dimensions and so on, and then do the analytics from there. I think, do we really need it right now? Or does our Observity backend provides the similar feature that we were looking at a few years back? Yeah, and, and a big advantage or disadvantage, I would say, nowadays, uh, it was localized. You couldn't distribute yeah. it easily. And nowadays, yeah. if you don't have something centralized and easy to distribute, you may be uh, crippling a little bit your capacity because I remember it was awesome to produce reports and cool things. But nowadays, you rather have dashboards, right? That you can just share with all your team and like, hey, check this out. Yeah, so. Okay. Mm, I'm gonna go to the other extreme. You go to the very, very beginning, but now that we are talking Tableau, reporting the end of your process, the end, the last step that we used to have, I mean, which the big questions. I mean, I, I remember that we used to do like you know huge uh, performance reports through words documents, where nobody was actually reading. Maybe one or two people, and then we were doing a simplified version through PowerPoints for the management. And and nobody was reading it. You had to be on site and present the numbers to the people. But and even think, when you presented, it was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the maybe uh, it's still it's still required. It's still needed. But if you do a continuous performance engineering approach, do we really need to build up a document with everything? I mean, documentation is really important. But maybe using Confluence to report things, or Jira to report things, or um, uh, distributed uh, uh, testing platform that uh, where you can report, you can keep track on things. Maybe in terms of reporting, will be more efficient than just firing a single documents that, yeah, will the first of all take times to create, and then maybe nobody will read it. I think that the biggest reason to keep these reporting tools that we had in the past, because yeah, of course, as you said, PowerPoint, Excel, and PDF. Uh, was the biggest tool, Microsoft Word, blah, blah, blah. But this is still useful or required if your test is going to be uh, regulations and that you have to have the document to, yes, be filed up in the cabinet, but there's your checking your process and the document. As a consultant, usually you have those delivery documents that mm -hmm. you need to deliver at the end of the project. So if you're doing, a, 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 if you deliver, uh, a gig from, from a consultant perspective, then yes, you will That's have to probably. go to the Yeah. But one, one new thing that we have now that we have access to all these logs and these metrics and these querying and dashboarding um, possibilities, I think even that can be automated now. And especially in a modern performance or continuous performance uh, environment where probably you are not just running low tests anymore, like these vaults, the biggest low tests, but you are continuously checking for performance. You want not a synthetic either, but you have your health check every sprint, to call it in a way. I think that the modern uh, set of tools is again to have this dashboarding capability and exporting it to a documentation way to document it. But even if you keep some of this information, I mean, I wouldn't keep performance metrics for more than six months, but if you eventually need to just generate something, like, yeah, let me quickly bring up my metrics, bring up my stuff with my querying powers that I just we, we just mentioned earlier. There's your report. I have these. Probably what would be more interesting in that report would be the, the story behind what happened. Hey, 
this connector, we found this problem, we found this thing and that thing, and there was this correlation. Probably as a, a, a retrospective forensic analysis, blah, blah, blah. And I think now these days, because people, I mean, I hope that most of the people is doing uh, not only one test and then two years after they do another test, uh, you did test major releases or even for components you do it in a continuity basis. What you're fishing for is to reg regressions or improvements. So um, even if you query that, you need to have somehow get the access to the previous test results as a reference test and be able to compare them and say, okay, so we increase, we, the performance was 20% uh, higher or, or I don't know, uh, give some numbers because at the end, uh, the, the lead product leader is fishing for, did we, are we better? Are we worse? Uh, what is the status? And, but how often be, how often would that happen nowadays with modern? I mean, I think if projects? you do if you do continuous, I mean, if you, this is a tool that I was going to mention later on, more on the automation piece, because uh, firing a test manually of you can do that, but at a certain state, there's a, depending on the maturity of the of the customer or the or, or your company, you are going to go through a, uh, automation, so trigger tests aut automatically, and then having something that that will help you to. Uh, detect those regressions and I think uh, storing uh, the baselines or the reference of numbers that you had in the past and be able to compare it and then do the the math to say how we are uh, do we are we better or worse and so on I think it's, it's crucial I think here you are mentioning the tool that automates the automations like one layer above I yeah. you just got me thinking of, of all the CI CD uh, platforms yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. There is a. You can either trigger the test directly from a traditional CI/CD, so GitLab, mm -hmm. Jenkins, Git, Git, uh, GitHub Actions, or whatever you want. Um, or but as um, well, you can use these uh, scheduling task platforms. Um, I, I don't Ansible? know. If it, Ansible is more like remediations, but uh, yeah, yeah. You can imagine like a workflow. Yeah, that's true. You can do that. But I think the. Um, the there is also, by the way, a small project that that I personally uh, think is very clever uh, is uh, Test Cube, where you can define mm -hmm. uh, the execution of tests and and how you're gonna and then with an API, then you you can either schedule it from there or from the CI CD, you can say, hey, Test Cube, start that piece, that piece of test. Um, of course, if if you have a tool that has an API exposed, then you don't need Test Cube to do that. You can basically, from a CI CD perspective send an API call or, or a command line, usually most of the tools has a command line, uh, that will spin up and start the actual test. You but, just uh, mentioned something also super important that I think modern tools to automate the animations should have. A way to API it, because with all our continuous and chained processes that uh, whenever you do a pull request or checking new code or you have this scheduled process that has to trigger your performance. If you don't have an API to hit and trigger those in an efficient way, you're crippled. In this modern environment, you won't be able to move forward. Yeah, or forward. either an API, a cassette, or a command line, but something mm -hmm. that will help you to say, hey, I want to trigger that test. I think that is one of the most important brick to enable you to go through the automation. Yeah, this is now we're getting into the automation tools. But one thing that I want to add into the analytics, uh, mm -hmm. the analysis before we jump into the other tools, because we I was briefly mentioning uh, the automation. We did but, report, uh, but not analysis. Yeah, but from a report perspective, mm -hmm. I think one tool, it's not a tool, it's a concept, but we call it tool for DevOps. Mm -hmm. And this tool is usually associated to SREs. It's SLO and SLIs. I think mm. if you do load testing and you want, and if you, especially if you do automated test, automated performance engineering, then you need a set of SLOs covering your infrastructure, your network, your response times. I mean, all the various KPI that, that makes sense for your environment, define those SLI, define the objectives behind the scenes, and then you can utilize different solutions that will help you to calculate the scoring, uh, like Captain is doing it, open source that will take all the results of the RSLOs if you hit the target or not. And then based on the the successful uh, numbers, you will get points. And based on that, you get it. Because in the, at the past, we were relying on the SLIs. We, we had an episode about that, by the way. 
uh, we did it last I year. I think we need to refresh that because yeah, uh, the, you're, you're mentioning some new things that we didn't last time. The points and how these uh, evolutions. Because nowadays, it's not that much as you pass or you fail the SLO and then you won't go to production. And this is a concept from SRE. I may be spoiling the next uh, that future um, SL episode. But yeah, you have your error budget. You are okay. You're fine if this takes a little bit longer. How many points are you having? I, I think setting these service levels, it's uh, it's going to be a huge episode on itself. Cause yeah, man, I think it's a tool. It's, the SLO mm -hmm. is a tool itself, and I think it, it's it's uh, it's a driver for your automations. Um, and I think the don't think about the traditional because when people think about SLO and SLI, they are many things. Oh, availability, performance, blah blah blah. The the golden numbers. For Two seconds for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think now you you could basically utilize SLOs to cover technical aspects that you are checking manually with your own eyes on the graphs. And why don't we express that through an indicators and then we tar we target that and we set an objective behind the scenes. So like I said, I mentioned the network. You can also think about the costs of the environment. You can think about the energy. I mean, you be creative. And then with those sets of SLOs, then you will be able to get a, a, basically an, a feedback on the objectives. And also it will help your, your organizations because then you will train the SLO approach and maybe the one of the SLOs that you've defined will be shipping back to the SRE so then they will use it for production. So I think it's it's, it's a great way of analyzing and, and have a, at least a, like a red light or green light on, on where you are in different level of the infrastructure. And, and you made a very, very good point that uh, a tool is not a piece of software that will help you on performance. It can be also a mental model, a concept like the SLIs, SLOs, and um, SLAs, although I haven't heard much on around those anymore because, yeah, those were a little oh, bit yeah. of the past, but we will, we will discuss about that in yeah. future episodes. But, yeah, in your performance, modern performance endeavors, not everything is a tool based on software. It's It can be a concept. I would even like dare to say another tool is the concept of the automation pyramid that you should attend to that and where are you automated things? How are you um, managing it? I have this concept of the 3D pyramid of performance automation because, and we should have an episode on that. On one hand is where do you automate? And in terms of load testing, how much should you be executing is the other side of the pyramid. And many organizations have those things upside down where I still see so many, so many organizations obsessed and focusing on low tests, like trying to bring down the system, like capacity testing, uh, breakpoint testing, all those things before anything else and trying to automate everything with browsers, with the front end, with things that it's useful in situations, but using the tool of this mental model, you'll have optimized um, performance testing. You'll be getting the best bank for your buck or not as many it's, sacrifices, it's a low, right? Long hanging fruit, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Before jumping into complex stuff that will take a lot of time to implement, uh, do uh, what is bringing, actually bringing value for your, for your, for your teams. Yeah. And, and this is another tool that you can have in your mind and your culture and your organization together, uh, uh, the, the service levels, how to set them, how to work with them, what to do with them. There are, that, that's a big topic. And also how to get the low hanging fruit in the best uh, possible way, most efficient. And using that as a segue, I have another element that I think it's low-hanging fruit that many organizations won't even pay attention to, web performance. What do you think of uh, tool-wise? What do we have nowadays that we can use for uh, web performance? I think, I, think uh, I would say that depends on what you test. If you test like an API web performance, well, I mean, you, you actually don't care. Um, for web performance, I think, uh, first of all, uh, if you have, uh, if you know JavaScript, you can think of a plugin that will measure uh, the uh, different uh, Google. I don't know the, the names of the Lighthouse. Google. No, um, 
the the the, the key uh, components that uh, web performance uh, users are using. I don't. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Google but, standard for web performance. Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah, remember. But, we come yeah. very well prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, I think DevTools, I mean, if you, before hitting some load against your environment, yeah, just use uh, DevTools. That will give you so much great information uh, about this. What are you thinking uh, of? Core Web Vitals? Yeah, Core Web Vitals. Google to the rescue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think the, the other, so DevTools from, from a browser perspective, from a single user perspective, will give you a lot of interesting numbers. But I use in the past, and I was a big fan of that tool. Um, it was uh, web patch tests. I know that they've been uh, uh, now uh, acquired, so it's not an open source project anymore. I just, um, I know that some user can still deploy their private instances. So um, one server, you have one server controlling everything, and then you put uh, a small instances that will be managed by the, the main uh, web page instance and one instance will be a browser or mobile device and, and basically you will hit the url um, and then a web page test will take video will take uh, pictures will do the waterfall um, uh, loading uh, views and and you get a lot of details and i think um, i remember that i was combining a lot with uh, load tests where at the end you can be clever and do some scripting combined with load test and you will get those figures back from web page test because web page test I was mentioned has an API, which means you don't have to just look at what wishes. You can basically uh, parse the JSON results and, and then send it back to your either your uh, testing solutions, or if you have uh, Observity solutions, you can you can send it back to the Observity solution as well. And this is a super useful. I think you already went a, a level a bit higher from what I was thinking, because having all this the API triggering it and automating the solution. It's a great set of results that you will get in terms of performance. And as you mentioned, you can link it with a load test and get all sorts of crazy interactions because here in performance nowadays, we're going to be getting so many elements of cross-pollination. You have the web performance, you have the API performance, you have the server-side metrics, you have the network, you have the database, and you have to put together in a, everything in a single picture. But coming back to the low-hanging fruit, in terms of web performance, um, there are some tools that I think are, how to say, uh, underappreciated in, in the performance world, manual web performance. Yeah, just a dev tool from yeah. a browser perspective. And you will get, uh, like I said, it doesn't make sense to jump into the heavy journey of automating, uh, processing, sending it back the data to uh, next door solutions. If you already know that one user is <clears throat> not good, it uh, doesn't make sense to go further. Uh, I think it's, if you're confident enough in, on your solutions and how the, the project is behaving or the application is behaving, then you can think about going move, move a step further by bringing the automation in, in the picture. On one hand, uh, as you mentioned, you bring the dev tools, and have a plethora of performance metrics uh, through those tools to right there and then you clicking through it and like some sort of exploratory performance testing and you find out and James says this, this at Nauseam, uh, the main element of performance testing is that it scales for one, one person. And so often that doesn't happen and it's pointless to go further if you can detect these things early and even the reporting part it's like, yeah, you can just get to a customer, a new client, a new system. And in a matter of minutes, I would even dare to say, you can provide some performance metrics and an early report and like, hey, yeah, you already identified that you have issues here, 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 there, and there. And that's manually. There are some other systems that pretty quickly will give you some information about how's the performance of your platform, <laughs> a little bit like uh, page speed insights. Uh, platforms that you put your website, your URL, as long as it's public, right? This is another interesting uh, limitation where you can very quickly see what is the performance of your application for other users. And it will give you a pretty good analysis on in this matter of quickly gather web metrics of what is happening in your system. And voila, you know what is... Um, happening or behaving slow right there and then super quick super easy 
uh, core web performance metrics together with Lighthouse as well from Google will also give you what an analysis. But again, if you have the Observity, Observity stack that has a suitable real user monitoring solution, usually even those go, the, the score of real metrics will be back in the Observity solution. So um, again, check out what you have in your environment. And if the current tool sets will respond to what you're looking for, and if not, you can start doing uh, through uh, a manual at one single user or automate with other tools again. You, you, you stepped ahead of the next level that I was going to mention, because through observability platforms, uh, all the ones that we mentioned, and uh, hope the audience doesn't think that these two guys that uh, are in observability companies can <laughs> stop talking about this. But it's true. Observability is becoming a cornerstone for performance testing. It's I think uh, just just think through it. I mean, people talk about uh, well, monitoring, monitoring. Now it's become observability. But keep in mind that when when we are thinking as a human being, or even a connected cars, if you have a Uber, the way this smart device take a decision to turn right or stop, or whatever, is based on the data that he has. And it's the same thing for with this the with a great observability. Then you can start thinking of moving a step further and do automation, make uh, automatic decisions and so on. So I think it's, it's it, we used to call it monitoring back in the old days in performance engineering because we were mainly looking at graphs. Graphs was the single source of the starting point of the analysis. And then if we had troubles, then we will say, hey, give me the logs. But we, we never... We, profiling was something where we tr started to do. I remember that we, we used to connect through profiling tools, but the performance was so bad, uh, impossible to utilize the application with suitable traffic. So we were not so much looking at the, the profiling aspects. Um, but I think now, as a modern practice, a modern performance engineering practice, if you have traces in place, you have metrics in place, you may have logs in place, Oh, I'm so jealous. Uh, you can do so much. I mean, the, the journey to understand and point out the problems will be so much easier than what we used to have to do in, uh, to get uh, a conclusion of, oh, this is the problem. This is the bottleneck. We have to optimize this. Now, you, you have a much more simpler way of detecting that. So I think it's it's really uh, uh, exciting moments. To you, you, you mentioned a very interesting element that I used to call it the quantum performance effect that when you were using some of these profiling tools to observe performance, you altered the performance because the tools were heavy and had all these issues, as you mentioned. Nowadays, they are way more efficient. Yeah, because I think the, the profiling way has changed as well. We, we yeah. used to do bah, everything. And now there is a, an algorithm that just picks some the common, most common frequent functions. So we covered on the most important profiles. Because I remember that we were flooded by <laughs> details <laughs> and you didn't know where to start or to stop, to be honest. Even nowadays, the risk of um, drowning in data, it's very present. And if you don't know very well what you're doing, it's something that uh, you, you'll hate it right away. Like, oh, I have so many metrics. No, no, please, no more. And it's like, but going quickly back to that element that you mentioned, the next level of manual performance, if you have great observability, like uh, ROM and some front-end web performance, the back-end is very well instrumented, even your databases. And you say like, okay, all that is in place. I'm going to manually use the system and gather all these metrics from my uh, observability platforms. And I would say it's the developer tools, but on steroids, because you have you get an extra level of uh, insights of what is the performance. With the developer tools, you just know that Yes, this picture and this image and this CSS, they are heavy, huge, and have issues. And this API is taking, I don't know, let's say five seconds, which can be problematic depending on your SLIs and SLOs that you defined earlier. And then what? With the, the, the developer tools, you are just like, yeah, it's a slow, it's a black box that I can tell. But if you have the observability in place, you can even dig deeper and find out, hey, probably in this line of code, you can you have some problems, this database call, or is, uh, I don't know, this service is taking too long to spawn up when um, you're requesting it. I don't know, you can go even deeper. And that's also, I would say, 
And I love that you call it the low hanging fruit because it becomes low hanging fruit. It's right there. And then you haven't automated, you haven't low tested anything, and you are identifying all these problems, which I don't know. I I think it was uh, comparing about, so I was saying that before, in the past we were uh, almost like a, being an old Titanic boat and we were uh, looking at the metrics from a graph perspective. We were not sure, so we were combining with the logs. We didn't have a life vest for everyone, so there was a limit of boats. And if you were not skilled enough, then you were dying in the middle of the sea. But now with the modern boats, at the end, you should also have a, everyone has life vests, you have a boat, you have more, more options to be rescued because you rely on traces, profiling, logs, metrics. You have so much details that helps you to be more efficient and survive in the complex world of performance. I love this analogy because uh, you are touching so many elements from the limited resources, the number of life uh, boats and the capacity to contain metrics because yeah we would love to have all the metrics for all the actions and everything that happens in our system but that very quickly can overload our stor log storage and metric storage and whatever we have and as you say we can drown pretty quick but on the other hand if we don't have enough of this observability capability to visualize to have the visibility on what is happening we may just looking at that type, the tip of the iceberg, and well, and then you hit the iceberg, and you, mm -hmm. and uh, now now modern boats has radars, has detect, look at satellites. There's so much details that helps them to draw to go safely to the right destination. Again, there's always new new randomized events that could happen <laughs> that makes the journey more <laughs> difficult. But I think it's better than than, than the past. For sure. So. Just to also wrap it up a little bit to start our ramp down, everybody there's might be tool, wondering. There's one tool that we didn't mention, and mm -hmm. I think it's it's the actual testing tool. <laughs> I mean, you need a testing tool, uh, otherwise you'll you, you'll be very difficult. I mean, you will re require a lot of people hitting the the the, the screen uh, to, to to reach out to the load. But yeah, obviously, obviously we didn't touch base in details. But obviously, performance you need load testing performance testing load testing tool behind the scenes, which. Now I am going to draw a line, which is, you, you mentioned low testing, which requires automation. Yeah. But there are many other things that we may be willing or needing to use a test automation rather than just low testing. In, and our modern performance automation tools, in the past, they focused on load testing. They were the load something tool for performance testing. And... But nowadays, they don't have this load prefix, or they are not just oriented at it. There are so many other things that modern performance testing tools will allow us to automate and test and check, rather than just generating this load. One that I can think of is synthetic testing, which is but super think, useful for... But I think a synthetic test is, is, is one single user running through a protocol-based uh, testing uh, approach. So if you do just one single one user, then you're almost close to the old fashioned synthetic testing we, we used to do. But yeah, I agree, I agree. And, and, and here powerful. we're gonna get philosophical because um, would you consider, I just, you said single user, HTTP hitting an API or something? There's both, you need to combine both, you know. If you have like a browser automation, just running once. You can once, do, can I, you... Think, I think sometimes when something is slowed down, if you have several, way of injecting, giving you a different type of details. So if I see that the performance from a browser perspective is bad, and then I check on the protocol level, it's good. Then I can say, oh, okay, so I have an idea. And same thing, if you do synthetic testing, for example, only from outside of the network, from different uh, geos in Asia, London, whatever, Europe, uh, US, but you never has said anything in local, locally in your Inside data center. Your yeah, so at the end, having those different options is a way of saying, oh, everything is bad, but locally it runs pretty well. So then you can have a sign, okay, it's not related to the app. There's maybe something, uh, the proxy or something, or DNS, whatever, that is bad. So And, and, and that's a big difference from the tools that we used to have, which uh, were using your automation to check the performance for a short period of time, but a lot of performance. Mm. But now... It's probably you had the same number of hits, but through an incredibly long period of time that they are just checking the situations. And here's where I may get philosophical. 
if you run five users or virtual users or threads or whatever your tool is using uh, just once or twice, is still a synthetic or did it become a low test already? It's so small. It depends of the uh, p pacing and think time that you put on those five users, uh, because at the end, five users could be more than just uh, one, five users, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that synthetic, if you, we, what we're looking at is a distribution over time of the behavior. So do you need actually five concurrent users at one single point, or do you need one user that doing it five times? They're doing every 50 minutes during the entire week. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you will have a better distribution so, um, of other behavior. But this is a new use that our, I think, test automation tools should let us know. And we were touching on it a, uh, a bit earlier, that our tools should have a CLI capability that makes it easy for us just to trigger these tests continuously. Because, yeah, also you can have an incredibly long pacing and let it running there which uh, some Kubernetes maintainers would not be happy to have that <laughs> <laughs> running at, that, at all the time, right? By the way, there's the amazing project called Kuber Healthy, uh, mm -hmm. where at the end you can design your centric tests from a from Kuber Healthy perspective. So uh, even if you're in a Kubernetes environment and you don't want to use uh, the centric test provided by uh, so, uh, commercial solutions or whatever, you can think of, uh, yeah, let's build my own centric tests and automate that through Kuber Healthy. And you will get uh, the real health or readiness check from mm -hmm. the application perspective. And in 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 this sense, also is as you mentioned, I think more than synthetic or more than performance testing or cataloging it as load testing, is a continuous check of performance health. I would say because uh, what we're trying to do, you jump right away. A synthetic, no, it's a single user protocol. Bam, pinging. No, no. For me, sending is not pinging, because uh, well, 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 I was just uh, no, because I think it. if you do, if you go on the direction and say I want to measure the actual health, I need to figure out a user journey that it that goes into my applications, and you know that from that user journey you will hit the card component, you will hit the payment component, you will hit the product catalog components and mm -hmm. whatever. And then if you do that journey and you know that behind each individual request, you have a certain level, number of uh, services or components that are involved, then you can say, okay, so it's responding. So I know that those are responding. And moreover, with trace tests, which is great, you can even do some of those assertions to see if the distributed trace generated is aligned with what you expect. So you can even check that the backend is actually responding. So I think you can design a modern centric testing combined with trace test and other solutions. So I think that that is pretty exciting. I think it is uh, the capabilities of mixing things now uh, are very interesting and important in this set of uh, automated performance testing. Because, and again, not only load and people, I probably have a lot of people tired with me repeating that, but performance testing is not load testing and you could uh, mix a few things in your continuous performance efforts with tracing, with uh, I, I just come came up with an example. Someone changed the JavaScript of your uh, front end. Your APIs, everything looks awesome for your monitoring, your instrumentation, everything. But if you have a script running a, a browser here and there every hour, I don't know, one browser one, on key user flows, yeah, with multi steps, blah blah blah, you will notice that that JavaScript got screwed, and now it takes ten hours just to process and show you the button or some of those things. Where if you had only another type of automation continuously checking, you would be like, yeah, my metrics look fine. I don't know why people are complaining. <laughs> or mixing it as well, that browser automation continuously checking with observability, with all the other tools that we were mentioning, you get like a full picture. And I think mixing these tools, what we try to or aspire to have is a full picture of the performance testing so that we can provide better insights and information. And before we close, I want to hear a quick perspective from you on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to do uh, combined with mobile, synthetic or mobile and user experience tools. Um, That's I think an interesting now, one, right? 
Yeah, I think I think to get real the details, you need to somehow to have something in the app itself that will give you more insights. Because mm -hmm. you triggering like the old-fashioned Selenium remote scripts in a mobile device, it, you will get some a trend, but the response time that you get from those those solutions are basically not accurate because you have the latency between you trigger an action and the action will actually click will take some time. So you, you're measuring. So if you know that the response time is not three, two seconds or three seconds reported by the solutions because you're adding that latency in, in the picture, then um, you can basically just figure out, oh, I got three seconds when everything is fine and suddenly I got 10 seconds. So I have a sign that something goes bad. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's required because everyone uses mobile devices, of course. But then the question is, should I do a more complex test? Because at the end, that's my app doing what is expected when suddenly someone opened Facebook or Instagram or whatever, or TikTok, or, and then suddenly my app is freezing because something is on, on, on the other side of the phone, something is, is freezing. Um, yeah. Or it's you happening. have a Snapchat filter working on while the, your app is open. Of course, you will see some performance, <laughs> interesting metrics. I think on, on this, and I, and I wanted to leave it to the end because um, this one is always available. People are looking for ways to automate the device, which is it's doable and important at times, but it's not the first step. As you said, like, hey, first of all, is my API that, that serves the device application working well? That's the first step. Uh, Hendrik, can we implement observability of our mobile device performance? So, yeah, I mean, if, in the case of in, in my my own play, Dan and Trace, they have an SDK that you can put on, on the actual mobile device. And, and then I, I know- Or in the, the app, open, right? Yeah, on the app, yeah. And then you also have open telemetry. I mean, it's, it's not mature enough, but you have a client a mobile instrumentation. So for iOS and, and Android, um, I hope that, some someday they will be mature enough, so everyone will include the open telemetry stack when they are building their app. So then, which means those metrics or their the, the traces itself will be started from the mobile device, and we will get some lot of interesting details that at the moment we are able to do, but we need to rely on vendor solutions. And I think you, I'm really eager to see that the open telemetry community is is doing more effort on that way. So then we will have an, an agnostic way of measuring mobile performance or mobile behaviors worst case scenario as you mentioned you can manually instrument your code put some telemetry on it is doable i highly yeah, recommend please please do it yeah but the thing is the question is that okay so i have million of mobile users so you have to define them what is the sampling rate that you need to define uh, and then also you will send the data to an endpoint so how do i make sure that i'm i mean there's a security aspect behind the scene as well so I think it's a great, uh, a great initiative to do go on that direction, but don't underestimate the journey. There are a few mm -hmm. things that is complex behind the scenes, so make sure that you're doing it proper in the right way. Yeah, in mobile devices, we also need to do an episode and invite. I have some friends in mind that can bring us more on how, because one on one hand, automating mobile is a pain. It's not pretty, and they haven't been the most open on sharing some of those metrics and things. And as you say, the integration gets interesting. And the new organization is like, okay, then what do I do? Well, there's going to be a perfect that episode that will help you figure out this. And I left it to the end because, yeah, that's an interesting, I don't know, could be these, you could do that. And mm, so we'll leave it there, I think, with this situation with mobile performance. Yeah. And again, like I said in the beginning, we cover a few tools, we cover a few concepts. It deserves to go deeper, of course. We can do that in more details. Let us know, by the way, uh, with the comments if you need more details on that. Or if you and again, we forgot one type of tool. Yeah, yes. I think we forgot a lot of tools, but drop if you have other tools, drop a comment below because, of course, there's so many tools that will be required to deliver properly your projects. Most probably, we will have a part two of this conversation because as well, it's huge and we only have like about an hour trying to keep these episodes <laughs> yeah. in in a manageable size like our metrics uh, to not to drown in our logs and metrics <laughs> we don't want to drown you in perfect so with that um henrik any closing comments uh i'll say um uh, i'm gonna go for titanic titanic so uh um so uh, uh 
make sure that uh, the water is not cold, uh, warm enough before drawing into the, the oceans of performance. <laughs> <laughs> um, from my end, I want to bring out that tool-wise for performance engineers nowadays is not only just, uh, just your automations. You heard us talking for an hour almost about all sorts of tools. The last and tiniest one was automation, which already is... We should do another episode just that. It's not that it's getting smaller, but the priority is moving. And, okay. and I'm going to also repeat it again. Uh, as you saw, uh, we discussed a lot of observability. Um, I was thinking uh, now you have today, uh, observability has evolved so much over the years. So uh, utilize the the magic and the beauty of, of those platforms will, will, yeah, simplify your journey for sure. Yeah, it's getting... Uh the fruit hanging lower for us observability will help you and bring that from that fruit down for you you have no idea how much check it out and well with that hendrik i think we're gonna call it a day for this episode of perfites that's great i want to thank everyone muchas gracias for uh tuning in Merci. See, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, stay tuned for the next episode because we will be analyzing and talking about all of these trends we already promised a plethora of episodes and topics that we need to dig deeper. So stay tuned. And with that, perfects out and adios. See you.